offset the insurance increase for this year. Um, I will tell you that this year we opened as planned. Um, we have been in school every day. We've had no hybrid learning. We've had no remote learning. And we fully expect to be expending our budget um, 100 percent this this year. Uh, and again, I think you'll see, even with regard to historical budget here, it's uh, over the course of, of time, we've tried to be pretty stable and pretty consistent. Here's another piece that's, that's interesting. This is the district reference group. Um, we are in reference group D, and um, we took a look at the historical per pupil spending that each district in reference group D uh, expends upon their students. And we've seen over the course of the past decade, Weathersfield was 10th out of 24 in per pupil spending in 2010. In 2020, we had dropped down to 17 out of 24. I do want to also speak this evening about the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. We talked about them last year. Um, I'd like to make sure I remind everybody how those dollars are being spent. Um, so what we have done this year with a total of $1,214,993, we have a math interventionist at each building. So all seven of our schools have a math interventionist. They are certified math teachers that support both classroom teachers in coaching as well as providing direct support to students. Um, we saw the need as being significant based upon our data uh, during the closure in 2020 as well as everybody um, coming back in last year. Our summer school programs across all grade levels, um, last year we expended uh, $80,000. Um, we had last summer just shy of 1,000 students that took advantage of our special education extended year program. They took advantage of our enrichment program. They took advantage of credit recovery programs. So by far the largest reach out to the community for summer school we've ever had. We will be replicating that again this year, and we have it in the American Rescue Plan funding for another year out, so two more years for that. We have um, also made it very clear how important it is to make sure we engage with our families. Uh, we have an elementary and a secondary family liaison. These are part-time positions that provide outreach to our families. Um, it's clear everybody sees what's going on in the world right now over in Ukraine. Uh, the Weathersfield Public Schools welcomed their first um, refugee from Ukraine last week and said hello to a student at Silas Dean Middle School. So these positions are very important to help engage families, whether they're coming from Ukraine, uh, Peru, Paraguay, um, wherever our families are coming from. And frankly, they're coming from all over the world. It's quite interesting. Um, we also are um, keyed in specifically at the secondary level for curriculum writing and professional development. Our social emotional learning and restorative practices encompasses the entire district. Um, this year we are at year zero of that work. Um, we have done an extensive amount of professional development and will be doing so over the next several years. We have a contract currently with Effective School Solutions uh, to provide student mental health and staff coaching regarding behavioral supports. Uh, and again, I think the um, reality is with the pandemic and students beginning to return to school, uh, the mental health needs of both students as well as um, some of our parents is acute. Um, again, I think it's, it's sobering when you're in your office and you hear some uh, radio call come in on the uh, police radio about a student who may be suicidal and can we do a wellness check. That's the reality of what we're dealing with. So educational solutions, um, we have clinicians in several of our schools and they're providing that ongoing support to families and students. That again is in the rescue plan funding. Bless you. We have uh, an investment in Rethink Ed. It's a curriculum uh, and software for tier one lessons related to social emotional learning. We have PPE, including items related to the music program. Uh, and again, not a huge number there, but we have gotten back into the uh, auditoriums and we've gotten back into the music rooms. So we're continuing to use PPE on our instruments. Um, 
our kids are back in, they're full time, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that we continue to mitigate the potential spread. So that PPE has been critically important, uh, specifically in the music room. And then again, one of the things we've done to take some of the pressure off from our operating budget, um, we have done some smart board replacements, $71,027. So those are already in place this year. So we are expending out the ESSER $2 this year. So let's take a look at the American Rescue Plan funding. That'd be ESSER 3. So this will be expended over the next two years. And again, this is going to continue to extend the math intervention positions, summer school programming, our family liaison employees, additional curriculum writing and PD, continued work with effective school solutions, we're also looking at um, investing a little bit in air quality testing and ventilation repairs. Um, Marell, you were at the uh, Hammer Elementary School with the governor. Uh, he paid a visit there after learning about our expenditure of $23,000 to bring outside air to the uh, music room at Hammer. Again, kind of low-hanging fruit. So we had uh, that classroom being the only music room in the district that was not suitable for um, music. So they were music on a cart. So we made that investment and we now have those kids as you saw in the earlier picture back in that music room uh, working with their teacher. And again, one of the other things we've done is Chromebook and smart board replacements. Again, you saw one of the areas that was not in the budget. We've utilized the rescue plan funds to offset what we would have had in our operating budget. So where we are with our budget timeline right now, uh, we did a board of education budget workshop uh, on the 5th of February. I presented the budget to uh, the Board of Education on the 8th of March. Um, that was approved unanimously on the 8th. Uh, on the 11th of March, we forwarded the budget to the town. Uh, I stand before you this evening, and then we know on Monday, Mar uh, April 18th, we'll have the townwide budget hearing, and then allocation of uh, BOE funds no later than May 13th. So there is our timeline. So. With that, I am ready, willing, and able to answer any questions you may have. We have uh, Mr. Kazaki here as business manager, so he will come up as well. Great. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Any questions for uh, Mr. Emmett or Matt while we have them? Councilman O'Connor. Yep. Thank you, Mike, for this presentation. You're welcome. Um, I had a couple of questions. You referenced that salaries made up 66% of the total budget and benefits 18%. How does that compare across the state and other municipalities? Yeah, good question. It's pretty consistent with what other municipalities are seeing also. Generally speaking, you're looking anywhere between 80 and 85% of budget, uh, school budgets being expended on salaries and benefits. Okay. Very consistent. Yeah. And, then, and then the other question I had was, one of the things I noticed you didn't fund was the upgrades for the operating systems and cybersecurity. And as much as I don't want to increase funding at this point or spending, that does concern me a little in that I know when things aren't upgraded on, if you're running an unsupported operating system, the support I don't think you're going to get for anything running on it because they're going to say it's an unsupported operating system. So right. it kind of may actually, in fact, increase costs as a result because you're going to have to find someone to come in and support it. And then the other thing, just with everything that's going on in the world, cybersecurity, I would think, would be something we'd be spending a lot of money on, not less. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you can. Yeah, I, I think in terms of what we're not funding, we're not funding a lot of hardware. The behind the scenes software piece, we're still, like, for example, our Barracuda network, our Aruba network, we're still going to fund those. And we've talked about this before. I think I said last year when we were um, debating the budget, it was talking about you know an average of 5,000 threats on our network a day. It is easily beyond that, especially now given the, the war over in um, Europe and what we're dealing with there, we're seeing a, a big increase. So you know, a good example, um, last uh, two weeks ago, we had the Social Justice Coalition. We were hybrid, so we were over at the high school. And the IT team was actually scrambling to disconnect um, our, these uh, uninterrupted power supply units from our network because they had gotten a uh, concern that um, they could be hacked 
and they could be taken advantage of to the point where they'd overheat the batteries and could start them on fire. So we actually unplug them. They still work. We can't talk to them now because they're not on the network. So those threats are, are continuously there. Um, and I think Jim DeRagan, who, again, with shared services, we see him on our side as network engineer. He is on the town side as well. Um, he is one that is a bulldog when it comes to that. So uh, things that we have needed, we've done uh, everything we can to make sure we budget for. Um, again, the bulk of the items you see here, Dan, are items that are more or less hardware items. Okay? Right. It's a great question. We'll go to that side. Councilman Hill. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Emmett. Um, health insurance. Um, so this is something that a lot of the boards and commissions we've been talking to, a big, a very drastic increase in health insurance this year. Um, the board, um, it's a self-funded plan, correct? So yes. <clears throat> last budget cycle, it was extremely low. I think it was a 2% increase. So is this a uh, looking forward basically saying all right people are more comfortable making claims on kind of non-emergency health issues and that's why we're just kind of correcting is that kind of what we're looking at here yeah that uh, that's definitely part of it we had a time period um, when the uh, COVID pandemic was raging where all elective surgeries had been canceled everybody was at home and the number of claims dropped off um, we have seen certainly a major increase in the number of claims. Um, we've had the challenge this year of how many maternity leaves? I, I think we're, we're somewhere north of 10 thus far with regard to maternity leaves. And again, um, Matt is on the insurance um, committee, so he gets the numbers on a monthly basis. Typically what we've seen, and you've been on the board and council, typically we'll see as the months go on, you'll actually see the number go down. So it was unusual to see the number actually go up. Um, so I think it's just indicative of the fact that we're seeing more claims. I think the other piece too is I think that um, USI is being careful in terms of budgeting for uh, more catastrophic claims and increasing just to be on the safe side and preparing for potential more um, catastrophic claims. And you know, the, obviously you said the 4.98 percent is the largest one since you've, you've uh, since you've been here. Correct. Um, and at this point, with the vast majority of going to contractual obligations um, and health insurance, things like that, you know, what, what in your eyes is kind of, as we always say, the first thing on the chopping block should, you know, we, we not be able to meet that number? Yeah, this is the hard part. And, you know, I try and strike the balance. Uh, I've been accused in the past of, you know, trying to stir up the doom and gloom. Um, I, I don't intend to do that. I just tend to speak realistically. Um, the big budget drivers, as you know here, it's people. And, uh, you know, one of the things we'll look at certainly is we'll look at retirements. We look to um, eke out savings with retirements. Um, one of the other things we may have to look at also is if I have a retirement, do I fill that position? Now, the impact of that certainly is I'm going to see class sizes go up. So we're going to hear parents concerned about class sizes. And I've got class size concerns over at Webb, fifth grade going into sixth grade. And I had some parents reach out to me from Highcrest in grade four. Mm -hmm. I've also got some uh, grade levels where I have a certain number of sections I'd like to maintain. Um, and again, if you get into significantly reducing the budget, I may end up having to um, reduce the number of sections in an effort to be able to, to balance the budget that way. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sure. You're welcome. Councilman Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Michael. Hello, sir. Nice to see you and my former colleagues and friends, John and Jim and Amanda and Janice, who I didn't get to serve with, but and Matt, great to see all of you. So I have a, a, a comment and a question, and, and certainly thank you for all that you do. And I think the last two years may have been the most difficult in education ever, certainly in my lifetime, uh, for, for going through the pandemic. So thank all of you for what you, what you do. Um, first the comment and then the question. Um, it seems like your two priorities uh, is the math interventionists and the social emotional learning needs and it seems like those are the two most important things that you're funding with the federal dollars. Is that is that correct? That's that's accurate. Yes. Yes, Ken. And then in my question, maybe I read the numbers wrong and maybe Matt or Michael you can help me, but I thought I saw 
that and it's in here too that the in terms of the percentage increase that 38 percent of it was salaries and 72 percent of the increase was benefits and if i add those two together i think i get 110 now my math i might need an interventionist for my math but i think I think that my math is right on that, and maybe I'm reading the numbers incorrectly or interpreting that incorrectly, but I, I did see that, so maybe right. you can help me with that. No, you are correct. It is over 100% for salaries and benefits. All the other major object codes show a decrease, so that gets us to the 100% total. So that 110, take, thank you, take away the uh, roughly 10% of the other items. So the the benefits piece of it of the increase is double the salary piece of the increase and are we pretty sure matt that that i know when we do the benefits that that's our best estimate do we feel pretty confident that that number is the number yes and that was determined through our broker usi in conjunction with mike o'neill and the board of education and as we mentioned we're at 15 percent the last insurance hey, Matt, can you just do me a favor? Yeah, yeah, sure. Just so that they can catch it on the video. Thank you. So USI had recommended a, I think it was about a 12.5% increase several weeks ago. And then working with Mike O'Neill in the finance department, it was recommended to input 15% for the Board of Ed budget. The last insurance committee meeting had a 16.5% number. I have not spoke to Mike O'Neill at this point. I don't know if we're going to remain at 15, increase to 16 and a half, if there's other surplus available to even reduce that number further. So we're at 15% in the board of that approved budget. Got it, thank you. That's all, Mayor, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, sir. Mr. Town, uh, Deputy Town Manager, <laughs> that's the second time I've done that today. It's Tom and Deputy Mayor. Uh, Combine the two. You want me to go next? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no offense to our current town manager. There is no deputy. So, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, I have several questions, like as usual, and uh, I'll try to get through it quickly. So I'm going, my notes were in reverse, so um, I'm looking at the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 funds, the math, uh, interventionists in the family, uh, I'm sorry, the effective school solutions, the 379,000 in the first year and 720 in the second year. Does that equate to positions? Are we talking about, you know, additional staff members? Yeah, you are there, Tom. You're looking at multiple clinicians that we have in our schools now, so that's what that number is. It also has professional development in it. What we want to be able to do is build the capacity of our own staff, so they'll also be providing professional development. We contracted as opposed to filling all of those positions because we wanted to avoid down the road having to deal with the potential of layoffs and having to pay unemployment. So that's why we ended up contracting. But these would be like semi-permanent, the same people would actually then spend the school year there? Correct. That's correct, And sir. then yes. come back the following year correct. under the ESSER 3 funds? Correct. Okay. My concern is probably yours is what happens in the following year uh, now that we've become accustomed to having these extra people there and uh, someone like me is going to say, well, you can't just add all that into that following budget. So that's uh, we're looking at the calendar already two years out. You're absolutely okay. right. Thank you. Um, going to the uh, first section that you, you spoke about personal services and salaries. Personnel. Yeah. Um, so the way I read it, you're actually adding 10 staff members to the budget this year from last year. You have uh, Strive Expansion, one full-time. You have two positions for the teacher residency program. You have six additional staff for uh, paraeducators. And you have expansion of the ABA and Strive. So, and uh, technology salaries, you have one additional technician uh, to support and serve as a dedicated webmaster. So I come up with 10. So we're actually increasing our 
employee count, if you will, mm -hmm. which is not actually a contractual obligation. You're, you're increasing the salaries. Do we have an idea of how much that would, would account for in, you know, salaries, benefits, the whole package? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Matt? Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to get that for you, Tom. We'll figure that piece out. Um, my concern is we're all tasked with doing more with less money. Um, we have to do it on this side of the table also. And uh, asking about what could be reduced if we had to. I see those 10 as an addition to what we're doing now. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's not required, but mm -hmm. I'm looking for ways to uh, reduce that 4.98. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, I just want to clarify, those positions are already, they're in the current fiscal year, 21-22. They're not projections for next year to hire. We have those employees at the Board of Ed currently. They're in that 57? They were hired throughout the course of the 21-22 year. But they, they weren't? Are, they are in the 22-23 budget, but it's not a position that we're looking to fill. They're already filled, and it's just a continuation into next year's budget. Were they in the last year's budget? No, not all of them. That's, and so, if you look at our current year financials, that's where we're running a deficit due to those So you're, indicators. you are adding them, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And then one just more curiosity question. The, the chart you had up there on per pupil spending, mm -hmm. is there any chart that shows correlation between dollars spent per student and performance? And performance? Yeah. We could get that information. I, I looked at, you know, some, look at Hartford, the city of Hartford, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they spend, what, 25000 per student or something? Yeah, it's a much larger number. They're not in our reference group, though. Well, I, I understand that. <laughs> I'm just trying to get a handle on, yep. you know, I personally, you know, I'd like to try and find a way to improve scores without spending more money. As, as would we. And I'm I think sure. that's one of the reasons why, like with the math interventionists. And, you know, to go back to your point with the 10 positions, you know, one of the things that I need to caution, like you mentioned the Strive and the ABA program, I can cut the Strive in the ABA staff members what do I do with the kids? Those kids need specialized instruction in a specialized program. So what will end up happening is I will have to go to out of district placements where I will have to pay tuition. So the savings that I would reap with reducing the number of positions I have, I would lose to special education tuition increases. And I know that uh, Mr. Kazar, when we were going through the process of the um, workshop talked about uh, I think it was last year or the year before we had 61 students that were in out of district placements where we paid tuition and uh, this year we were somewhere between 44 and 48 so we've reduced so what you do is we've taken the savings from those tuitions and we've invested that back into the staff so right now do we have enough uh, staff to handle the 48 or so students that you spoke about? We, we are close, but we're not completely filled with our paraeducators. Okay. So are you anticipating more pupils in the Strive in ABA program, and that's why you need six more? I would anticipate that we will see additional students, whether it be students that we write IEPs for in the district or students that move into the district from other towns. So I'll give you an example. This year I had a student move in from a neighboring town that was in an out-of-district placement. So I ended up having to pick up the cost of that out-of-district placement. We will come together, have a uh, PPT meeting where we talk about whether or not we have the ability to serve that student within our district. If we do, we'll move that student into district. Otherwise, we'll continue to support the out-of-district placement. And then just one last question. Sure. Uh, if, for example, you, you think you need six more uh, paraprofessionals, paraeducators, uh, and the number did not increase, is that something you would say, okay, we don't need four of them? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And we may also have a situation, too, Tom, where I may have a student that requires paraeducator support. The student moves out of the district, and I no longer need that para. 
Um, we do see attrition of paraeducators over the course of the year, uh, over the course of the summer as well. So again, I'm not one that wants to pad numbers here. I want to provide the appropriate level of staffing support for our students and make sure we have quality programs. Great. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. You have a question? I'll just uh, ask a clarification. Is that right? Go ahead, brother. Thank you. One clarification. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, I'm sorry, yes, sir. Mike, just a question for you. Actually, it was two clarifications. So there are no new hires in this budget because these are all existing people and you're looking to extend. So this new correct. budget is staying. Zero new hires is correct. Correct. Okay. And then the other one was um, I'm very familiar with Strive and ABA and the impact COVID has had on the behavior of a lot of kids. And I know there's been a huge uptick in the number of kids that are getting these types of services as a result of this COVID rebound or whatever they're calling it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also realize it's incredibly expensive to outplace these kids. And if they have like these self-contained programs or what have you, or you have to outplay, it's incredibly mm -hmm. expensive. We have a bunch of kids that are outplaced. Has anyone ever done a cost analysis on whether or not it would behoove us to hire more ABAs? Would that be less costly than outplacing them and setting up our own? That, that is exactly what we have in place. Um, we did not have any Strive program at all um, dating back four years. Um, the Board of Education charged us with developing these programs as a means of keeping our kids in district. Um, and again, even with ABA, we had an ABA program at the lowest level, pre-KK, and that was it. We've now expanded it all the way up through grade six. So we've definitely been able to build our programming within, and we have absolutely been able to avoid um, out, outplacement costs. But how many kids are currently outplaced? Uh, currently, I want to say the rough and tough number, again, an estimate, as I said earlier, between 44 and 48 students. And that roughly equates to what from a budget perspective? Oh, and that, well, gross budget, we're spending on tuition about three and a half million. Three and a half million. And we have some state revenue coming in. But in order to expand, we don't have the physical space. I think we're pretty much maxed out now with this recent expansion to sixth grade. So if there was a building in town that was available, you could actually take advantage of that or do they have to be actually inside the school and adjacent or what have you? Good, good question. You, what you ultimately want with special education program, you want to maximize the time you have children with disabilities with non-disabled peers. So, you know, can you, can you do uh, like an in-district school for special programs? You certainly can. Would you meet the auspices of time with non-disabled peers? You wouldn't. So, Unless it was built out of the school. You build, and again, um, Dan, to that point, we've tried to make sure that we put our programs, like for ABA, for example, it's all at web, because what I can do is I can coordinate all the services, as opposed to having to hire additional people like Tom was talking about. You know, and even with like preschool, I have those that feel, you know, let's do preschool in every single building. To try and deliver the related services for those kids, it's, it's impossible. So it's much more efficient to have these types of programs in one building. So it reduces the number of transitions the kids have to make. And I'll give you an example. Preschool, when I got here in 2008, the three-year-old preschool program was at Hanmer. The four-year-old preschool program was at Webb. So if I had a Highcrest student, uh, preschool, Highcrest preschool student, they'd go to Hanmer for the threes, Webb to the fours, and Highcrest for five for <coughs> kindergarten. So we really tried to um, consolidate the program so we had fewer transitions for the kids. And again, we maximized the efficiency of service delivery. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. Thank um, you, sir. Mine are, so one of my questions is you mentioned retirements earlier, but do you, I, I don't, unless you said it, do you have a, estimated like a number that are planning to retire where you're preparing for I have right now I'm anticipating approximately six retirements I may get more and typically speaking what happens as I had mentioned earlier with our paraeducators we may see more attrition um, there but right now um, we're actually in the process of getting ready to post our positions uh, so for example if uh, any speech and language pathologists out there we're looking for speech and language pathologists uh, off the top of my head, I'll be looking for a social studies teacher. 
uh, at the high school. I'll be looking for a science teacher at the middle school. Uh, I'll be looking for a couple of special education teachers who are going to be retiring. So, yeah, right now we're anticipating approximately six, Ryan, and that is uh, subject to change. And right. the six in the budget, it accounts to 160000 in savings, and that's right. in the proposed budget. And as far as your manning goes, then what, do you have like a percentile where you're at? Like you want to be 100%, but you're at 70%. Where, where are you at right now? Do you know? Do you know that kind of ratio? Okay. Um, then the other question is, and this is kind of minor compared to the other stuff, but mm -hmm. as far as your subscriptions, um, how in like your tech services, how often are we reviewing, and this is not belittling the work you guys do, but how often are you reviewing those seeing how much you're actually using them and you know if you still need them that is a great question and that is one thing we do on a yearly basis because one of the things we saw historically we definitely had some overlap so we have um, for example we have an instructional supervisor for k6 curriculum that person also has a connection with technology as well. So what she'll do is she'll look at all of the software that we utilize and she'll look to see whether or not our teachers are using it to the, the degree that they're using it. And if people are not using it, we do not buy it. We move along. And with regard to the technical side, I've also got between Jim DeReagan and I also have Jeff Telke, um, who does a lot of the back end work. If we have systems that become outdated or we find that they don't meet our needs or they're not effective, out they go. So that's done on a yearly basis. Got it. And that's, and I'm, I guess my follow on is like uh, one, my son's at Charles Wright. Uh, one thing we use is, is Seesaw, which I yes. absolutely love. Yes. But I think we could really capitalize on it, which would help us decrease that paper value and that cost that we're spending on printing paper and sending yes. paper and whatnot. So just wanted to kind of touch on that thing. Yeah. So thank you for, Good point. for letting me know that. Thank you. Um, Council B Councilman Biggs, you took a couple of my questions from me on the retirements and uh, um, <laughs> looking at uh, procurement of services. Um, one thing I did have a question on, um, you, you'd mentioned the ELL, and it's actually, you didn't have 125,000 included in that. Correct. Um, what is, the, and you mentioned the, the Ukrainian family coming in, um, which is great news. Um, are we seeing a more diverse population? Um, you know, what do we have for ELL teachers? I mean, is it Spanish predominantly? Is it uh, um, Eastern European? or do we have uh, ELL teachers to be able to provide full services? Yeah, we, we have several dozen different languages and dialects that are spoken. Um, it is impossible to find an ELL teacher that teaches every language. Um, they are certified in being able to provide students with specialized support to help them learn English. Uh, another one of the great things with our one-to-one, -one, with our Chromebooks and our technology, there are all kinds of translation services that we can tap into. Um, I had mentioned earlier um, in the presentation about, you know, the family from Ukraine. Um, we had multiple families from Peru. Um, last week, uh, I attended the family learning program at Trinity Episcopal Church, and we had several families there from Peru. Um, talking with the people, uh, empowering people, our UConn pet program, I met with them last Thursday and listened to the stories of our parents. We have a parent that uh, has lived here in Wethersfield for a year, came over from Albania. She was a math teacher in Albania and is working on developing her English so she can bring that skill set into, uh, into a school system. So we're definitely seeing an increase in um, the diversity across, from across the world. Okay. Um, going back to, I know we talked a lot about healthcare and healthcare benefits, elective surgeries. Um, does the district provide like a wellness program at all, um, an incentive for uh, teachers, administrative staff to um, routine checkups, yearly checkups that uh, help to hopefully defray some of the cost of healthcare? Great question. And in the past, we had. And uh, we struggled mightily with the administration of that program. Uh, it was a third party administrator for that, and um, it was unsuccessful. In the sense that staff didn't take advantage of it, or it just wasn't implemented well enough? It was not implemented well. Was there any um, 
projected savings that they used for that to to market it? Yeah, we'd have to go back. It's been a while, Mike. Okay. Um, that could be something, you know, as we're looking at 15, sure. 16 and a half percent yep. increases that possibly a wellness. Um, staff positions with administrative staff. I know you're looking at, I forget what the number was, uh, possibly six retirements through the district, I would assume teacher retirements. Yes. Any retirements from the administrative staff? I'm not pointing any fingers to anybody in this room. No. <laughs> <laughs> July of 2026, I'm eligible, but <laughs> no. Um, at this point in time, uh, no, we actually had a retirement last uh, mid-year. Tom Moore, our longtime principal at uh, Weathersfield High School, retired. Um, I'm not anticipating any administrative retirements um, upcoming this year. Okay. And uh, I think that's, I mean, these guys did a great job of asking the questions um, on out-of-district placement I had questions on. Uh, and then, um, obviously, you know, benefits, those are, are the drivers. So any other follow-up questions for them? Okay. Well, if that one position for a social studies teacher is open in a couple of years, maybe I'll get back to you. There you okay. go. That was my, that's what I graduated with. I'd love, we'll schedule an interview for you, Mayor Rell. Um, <laughs> I again, I just, civics. I want to uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be with you this evening. Um, if you have any further questions, do not hesitate to reach out to Matt or myself via email. We'd be happy to answer any questions. And I know, Matt, we got a little bit of homework to do. Um, we'll get you those answers to the questions that we weren't able to answer. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you to the board for your work and crafting this. And right now we'll take a pause between the Board of Ed and the council meeting. We've got a couple minutes.